You want to start with that? You want to start with that? We have time to do an open meeting to talk about it now. We can start with that. So we don't have to wait. Yeah, we can start with that. Okay. I mean, it's just miscellaneous items, so if you want to start with that, that's fine. All right, the meeting will come to order. Please turn off your cell phones, watches, Blackberries, anything that makes noise. Um, will you call the roll, please? Certainly, Madam President. Mr. Jones? Present. Ms. Conley? Present. Mr. Rogers? Here. Ms. Simon? I'm here. Mr. Greenspan? Here. Mr. Miller? Present. Mr. Brady? Mr. Germana? Mr. Gallagher? Here. Mr. Schron? Here. Ms. Conwell? Here. Um, this is the work session of the Cuyahoga mm -hmm. County Council, and the purpose of this meeting is for the council to be able to um, discuss various matters uh, in a public session and um, before going into the formal session so we can discuss things in a more informal manner but yet open to the public. Um, you want to note the presence of Mr. Jamana. Welcome, Mr. Thank Jamana. Um, and we have, um, just for the discussions of all of the items on our agenda tonight, and um, I think Ms. Simon is asking that we start with a um, particular item because we have some um, persons here that would like to make a presentation. Don't rush. I'm here. Thank you very much. We have um, in the audience, what Mr. Ch did you want to, Jana Cronenberg is here, Mr. Shannon's here, and we have other individuals here just to briefly touch on a matter that will be um, referred to the Justice Affairs Committee at the 6 o'clock meeting. And they're here now. Rather than have them wait till 6, I thought it might be advantageous just to come up if you had anything to say at this time before the whole council. Thank you, Madam President. The number? Yes. As they're speaking, I can give you the number for when they're done. Uh, good afternoon, Madam President and members of council. I'm delighted to have this opportunity and thank you for taking us out of order. Should be page five of 11 on the council agenda. Is that correct? Bottom of the page, P. Okay. And I'll, I'll get the number. All right. Uh, you may be seated if you like. Oh, no. I'm okay. Oh, we just okay. raised it uh, up. Just, okay. I, um, I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you out of order this evening. Um, Dr. Vrabel and Rosemary Creedon are here tonight from Mental Health Services and will certainly come to the Justice Committee meeting on Friday to present more fully. But the contract that we have on this evening's agenda is the Children Who Witness Violence contract with Mental Health Services, funded partially from Health and Human Service dollars and partially from Victim of Crime Act dollars that are federal dollars passed through the state. This is a program that's operated by the county since 1999, um, serving a number of Cleveland police districts and a number of suburban police departments that basically sends crisis intervention teams to crime scenes where children are present and offers a brief intervention and referral outward. outward. It's been enormously successful. I believe their referrals are now, even in only part of the county, running at about 1,500 a year with some six or 700 families actively accepting the services that are offered at the interventions. It also is nationally recognized through a national NCTSN affiliation, has been funded broadly and forms the root of our Defending Childhood initiative that we've just begun. The Councilwoman Simon and um, President Connolly came to a meeting on Friday that's made us one of eight demonstration projects in the country under a direct attorney general initiative to really ramp this up to intervention, prevention, intervention, and treatment of families and children exposed to violence in their homes, schools, and communities um, in a huge way. So we're very delighted to have this contract in front of you. They can speak at more detail in the committee, and I thank you very much for your time. If anybody has any questions, we can try and answer. Yeah, I'm, I'm not clear how this program will interface with the program that we went to Friday with the federal funds. 
Well, these are partially federal funds, but the program on Friday, the genesis and what I think drew them to us as a pilot site is the original children who've witnessed violence model and the ways that we've leveraged that model in the community to raise other funds for other initiatives here. Because Cuyahoga County was selected among applicants from all over the country, yes, is that right? Yes, and we're one of eight. And of the eight, um, we have a full application due there May, May 1st. And out of that, we will receive either a half million dollars for three years of implementation or $2 million for implementation over three years. Um, those of you who know me know that we're all convinced we're gonna get the two million and we're working like dogs for it. Thank, thank you very much, Ms. Cronenberg. We understand how hard you've working. I'm very excited to see what, what kind of um, result you're gonna get. And, and in particular, we're referencing 2011-0153 um, contract. It's a resolution, so. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. And just, Madam President, to members of council, um, the meeting we attended Friday, President Connolly and I, was remarkable to see the collaboration among different interest um, stakeholders in, in this um, project to really address the cycle of violence that perpetuates itself, and we see it manifest in so many different ways. Um, through our work in health and human services and on every level from beginning to, to jail to, to reentry. So this is really getting, getting to the root of the problem one, uh, in a very dynamic and aggressive way. So I'm really excited and really thank everybody who's participated in this project. All right, now we have um, a somewhat lengthy agenda and um, rather than um, would you want to start at the top, or do you want? Are there specific items that um, members would like to address in in this session? We have a number of matters that will be referred to um, committee. Um, there are uh, the usual or the bi-monthly um, adjustments to the budget. Um, I don't know if Mr. Rubino is here. If there are questions on those, um, we also have the listing of those contracts that were let by the county executive and copies of us are, of that information is given to us for informational purposes. Um, Madam President? Yes, Mr. Miller. Uh, item number nine is the uh, contracting and procurement ordinance and I can uh, give a brief update right. to the council on that. Uh, uh, the latest version of the contracting and procurement ordinance was passed out of the Public Works Committee at, at the last, last meeting uh, last Wednesday. However, in the interim, our, uh, our new law director, Mr. McClough, uh, asked for uh, the opportunity to review and provide some, some comment, which he's in the process of doing. And we also received some uh, input from Jeff Applebaum uh, regarding the matter of change orders. And, and so, uh, so the ordinance uh, needs a little work and, and, uh, and at the uh, regular council meeting tonight, I'm gonna request that it be referred back to the uh, Public Works Committee for uh, one more round on, on the 20th. And, and uh, hopefully uh, at that meeting we can uh, pull these sources of information together and, uh, and produce a version that we could bring back to Council on the 26th, which would uh, uh, give us time before the interim ordinance expires on May 10th. All right, thank you. And also welcome Mr. McClough. This is his first official meeting. All right, um, would we like to go, just go through the agenda? Are there specific items that um, persons, council persons would like to discuss? We have a number of um, items under um, item 11. Um, that's gonna call for the vote on the appropriations. Um, does everybody have an opportunity to take a look at those? Madam President? Yes. I had a question on um, item number 12 
regarding the committee report and recommendation to withdraw resolution from consideration? Is that on the, on the kitchen? Yes. Right. Well, Mr. Gallagher can uh, address that. And the question? Evidently, this is something new. So, <laughs> and I thought what we would do is go in the committee, bring it back out, and vote it down. But this was a procedure that I was told that we were going to uh, follow from here on out. The um, the legislation first came to uh, public safety. Uh, we we were going to have the hearing on it, but the the executive withdrew the uh, contract before we actually even started that. They kind of let us know a little bit late in the game. So the process evidently now, Gene, if you would actually uh, help us through this because it is new. Certainly, um, we decided that we couldn't just let it flounder and just stay in committee and die because then what happens is too many things get stuck in committee with you know no resolution to them. And so I spoke with the um, um, uh, Ed Morales and Nora Hurley, and this was the procedure that we came out with, that committee actually does have to do something with it, and what they're doing with it is coming out, giving a report, and recommending under the circumstances for this particular one that it be withdrawn at the request of the uh, county executive, and therefore a parliamentary motion will be made, uh, you know, just uh, favoring that motion that it be withdrawn from consideration. Now, if we didn't do that, then this uh, requisition number 18560 would then be in limbo, and because the department needs to go back out and rebid and re-advertise for this particular service, they wouldn't be able to do that because in the uh, record, uh, we have this particular item sitting and waiting for uh, council's approval. So, Madam President, is it my understanding that we're we're still moving forward with trying to get the kitchen renovated and we're just looking to rebid it? Right. Okay. If I may, Madam President, I think the, the understanding is that there is no need for a motion to withdraw it. It's just it's it's withdrawn, announced that it's withdrawn at the meeting. In discussions with Mr. Miller, he recommended that we do a parliamentary motion which does not require any type of resulting resolution, just in a an official thing to uh, recognize that it was withdrawn by council. The motion to acknowledge the withdrawal. Pardon me? The motion basically to acknowledge the withdrawal. Yes. Uh, all right. We, I mean, I, I think we should go with the ruling of the law director, whatever the law director says. We Either way, I don't know that it, it really makes a difference. There is no need for the motion, but if the motion is to, to acknowledge right. that it's been withdrawn, that's, that's right. fine. Madam President, Mr. Miller. Uh, I'm, fine with, I'm fine with the uh, law director's recommendation that, that the president could just uh, acknowledge the fact that the executive has withdrawn the resolution from consideration. All right, any other um, items that we have um, uh, that, that anyone would like to discuss? Madam President. Just, uh, Mr. Mr. Greenspan. Just since we, we have apparently some time, I have a question, just I see Ms. Tewin's out there, Director Tewin, on these public works projects, just a, a general question. What type of notification is given to either residents or the community when one of these projects is physically about to begin, the actual road construction? Bonnie too and Public Works Director. Um, usually what we try to do with, with most of our projects is hold some type of, of public meeting uh, several weeks before the project actually starts, kind of lay out the project, the scope of the project, what the intent of the project is. Um, so we usually um, do that at least a month or so ahead of, of the project actually beginning. Okay, uh, just a general question. Yeah, how do you notice that? I mean, how do you, do you send letters or? We do. Um, we're, uh, we actually hand out flyers. We drop them in the doors or in mailboxes. Um, and we actually walk through the project site and we let all the, the residents and businesses know um, that are along the, the project site. Mr. Schwein. Um And I know we, we just had this discussions before the meeting, but it, it might be, uh, an excellent way from a communication standpoint. Once we've taken the actions here at, at council, 
to communicate and ask is there any special consideration the community has that might reflect on a date that uh, that could affect community activity in this particular one we just approved the Gates Mills Bridge and I heard from the mayor uh, the other day that on the 4th of July is the day in which they march all their their floats and their parades and things like that across that that bridge and it would have a significant effect on their community and just maybe by communicating with a letter is there, is there anything that we need to be worried about or any public consideration or something of that nature just as a as a uh, as a communications vehicle it might be a good thing and just one more way to open that dialogue with the, with the communities because there might be something that they're not aware of as far as the start date or you're not aware of that might be a community date so and we actually try to do that during the design phase of right. the project that we're in close contact with the the city engineer or the the um, legislators in that area so we try and do that not everybody thinks yeah. of everything yeah. you know at that time but I, I understand what you're saying that until it's actually on top of you you don't think about the fact that the floats gonna go over this bridge so it's well, some of these things we, we started talking about are, are Yes. Uh, items that have been held holdovers from three, four, five months ago, and at, at, the, at the moment, in the middle of the winter, when the snow's mm -hmm. there, you're not thinking about the the Fourth of July uh, float going across the bridge, and so. Yeah, and when we do these pre-construction meetings, all the the um, the the local legislators also get that same information. So we send the flyers to to City Hall also, so they can, they're aware of what's going on. Now, how much are you involved in the um, inner um, inner belt bridge? I mean, do you, are you, because we're probably going to start getting calls from people who, whose, you know, access is cut off and we need your direct dial number to, you know, to send all those constituents to you, but. Well, I, I used to be very involved in the Interbell project, but now that I have the opportunity to serve the citizens of Cuyahoga County, I'm no longer involved. Um, we can get the appropriate um, contact information to those people. There is actually a hotline that um, ODOT has set up with anybody that has any questions, comments, concerns that they could they could either um, email in through the website or call. Yeah, we, we should probably get that and they put it on the website because you know the constituents would be looking to us. I can do that. It would just be a link to the the inner inner belt project website and then they have um, an information section there. Okay, so you're not really interfacing with them at all? No. Okay. Uh, Mr. Brady? Um, just as long as we have the director up, um, we spoke briefly uh, the other day and, I, and for the benefit of the committee and also for myself, what is the timing of the contract for uh, power for the um, um, county buildings? Actually, it's it's. I just saw that it, it's in the agenda today yeah, the for agenda. first reading and reference to committee. It's today. item number um, D on page nine of eleven for the council agenda. All right, time is good then. <laughs> Thank you. No, no. I, I wanted to hear the answer. Well, oh, uh, well, what I had the the nature of the discussion was um, um, we were talking about how that. Um, um, was going to be bid and whether Cleveland Public Power would be um, responding with a bid uh, if they could, if they had the capacity to um, be able to provide power to any of the buildings uh, downtown and, uh, and also uh, what deregulation meant for the ability to bid other than to just one provider. That was the point of the question. It's, I mean, it's a, yeah, it's not really a want, question. It, it's not really a question, no, <laughs> yeah. but that's what yeah. the conversation was about, and that's why I asked about the timing of it. Um, yeah, the, anything, the, the, any, any response what, what's to in that? the agenda I mean. is a request to advertise, I believe, um, and, and there'll be an advertising period. It'll give um, uh, companies an opportunity to put together some, some um, packages to us so that we can look at um, cost savings for our electrical service. I had had some concerns that in the past maybe that there had been um, um, a relationship that had just developed uh, that was so cozy between the one provider and county government that there really wasn't a competitive process. Madam, Madam President. Yes, Mr. Miller. On the sa same item, this uh, particular contract was discussed last week in, in the Public Works Committee and, and, uh, and we received testimony from the administration to the effect that the legislation 
was worded in in a way that it gives the administration options as to how the RFP is sent out and and that that it it could be sent out so that that there would be uh, uh, one bid taken on those uh, buildings that are within Cleveland Public Power's service area and and a and a second bid taken in areas outside of that service area, and it would be a question of the administration trying to decide whether that approach would be advantageous in terms of the probable result. Okay. Anything else for Ms. Dewan? Any other items on the agenda that you'd like to ask questions of her? All right, thank you. All right, let's go through the agenda then. Um, Um, Jean, do you want to discuss our public meeting within a meeting? That yes. might be interesting. Yes, ma'am, yeah, Chair. Okay. I was just going to ask if I may have permission to okay. address a few of the items on okay. the agenda. Okay. On item, to start off, item number six, uh, my apologies to all of you. However, no one has had an opportunity to review the um, April 5th minutes, and so therefore they will not be under consideration this evening, and we'll have them with the next meeting packet for your consideration. Um, they were a little complex, and I just wanted to make sure that they were absolutely correct. Um, <clears throat> secondly, for the item for the bond council um, resolution, that would be resolution 0152, item O on page 5 of 11. Uh, just this afternoon, we, we received some additional uh, suggestions for changes to this resolution that was drafted by Bond Council, and those uh, suggestions then will be, since this item is being referred to committee, uh, those suggestions then will be submitted to the committee for um, their consideration and recommendation as to how the, it will be brought back to the full council. And then finally, you'll have noticed at the end of the agenda, item number 14, there is a hearing of objections uh, for a particular road project. And um, this is required in order to get the, um, to have the council approve all the surveys, plans, profiles, estimates of costs, rights of way, et cetera, et cetera. And so a public hearing will be held and we will go through an actual script. Um, it must uh, begin, it was advertised for 6.30 p.m. So as long as we don't start uh, before 6.30, we have to have it at least after 6.30 uh, as the time period. Um, what, will, what needs to be done is that there needs to be a motion to suspend the rules um, and I think the next time that we have a hearing of objections on the agenda I will put uh, first reading adoption under suspension of rules if that's in fact what the uh, department uh, needs for that particular public hearing in order to proceed and so this hearing of objections will be contained within the actual uh, council meeting so um, uh, President Conley will convene the public hearing, ask for um, opponents and proponents to the project. Uh, you'll receive information by the uh, Director of Public Works regarding the uh, particular road project. And then um, once we have the suspension of rules taken care of, then the resolution will be read into the record and the uh, council will be asked to uh, consider and adopt that particular resolution. That's basically all I information I had. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. I'm still confused again. Madam Chair? Yes. I'm wondering if I could pose a question to uh, the, the clerk concerning the, the setup uh, tonight, okay? Uh, you know, when these things are 200 pages long and we get all these things to, to look at, would it be too difficult to put a page number where each resolution is so that we're not all flipping through the the item is actually um, each of the items does have a page or each of the booklet does have a page number at the bottom yeah uh, let me give you an example um, yeah I see what you're saying there was uh, this, this one resolution, and I know we're not going to be doing this in the future, 
concerning approval of sewer contractors. Right. Okay, and Correct. so I saw the number, but I was fl flipping back and forth trying to find it. So what I'm saying is, if on the agenda, if we had a page number for... Send the entire packet to the print shop, and then once we send it, they number it. Okay, so it can't be done. Okay. It can't, so, can or cannot? I, I don't know that it can't be done, but we'll check and see what capabilities they have. Okay, it just would be a lot easier to, if at the resolution or ordinance number, if we had a page in the agenda, we wouldn't have people flipping back and forth trying to find it. We did have a capacity when we only had three commissioners that we actually tabbed their corresponding numbers, but, you know, I have no staff, and <laughs> there's 11 of you now, so. <laughs> yes. We don't need a tab. <laughs> if we just had the number, we could find it pretty pretty quick. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll work with the clerk next week and see if we, we can investigate that, because, I mean, it is, well, I actually printed mine out at home, went through it last night, but it is, uh, it does get confusing. That's why I have all these little tabs and things in here. Would you do mine too? <laughs> no, I'm not doing yours. <laughs> I know I'm spending a fortune on. Uh, and if I if I put in a requisition for my home printer, um, uh, the plain dealer will make a big deal out of it, so I just pay for it. We'll, ch yes. we'll check with the the print shop and see what capabilities they have, and get back with you. Thank you, Madam President. Buying ink all the time. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President. Uh, uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, <laughs> When you send this over to the print shop, do you send it over in a PDF format or do you send it over in, in some kind of other document form? Like this? Yes and yes. Okay, you send it in a format other than just PDF so that if you send it to us, what, what I received on my laptop is a PDF. That's which, correct. Which is not searchable. If That's we correct. could answer that question where if it was sent over in, uh, in a word form, you could punch up that exact resolution and it would find that page for you. Uh, to to handle all uh, of the event. attachments are in PDF format oh. because they're all oh. attachments. Okay. And um, the uh, agenda itself is in a Word document that we send to ISC so that it can be searchable. And the minutes are in a Word document so it can be searchable. But all the attachments are PDF. That's correct. I mean, if they could be sent over in a Word form, then <laughs> if they would come up, then you could have the best of both worlds. We're getting close to being able to figure out how to make it searchable. We've been working with the ISC on how to convert that was if they get a Word document and then it's converted to PDF, it'll then be a full searchable document. So just give us a little bit more time and that'll be resolved. Okay, because if he, if, if he thinks flipping through the pages is bad, you should hit the scroll button on here and it's just, yes. it takes you long, yeah. longer than finding it. In it, it. It will also hopefully someday be soon, you can uh, through the website just click on the the index and go directly to that item as well. So right. there's there's stuff we're working on. Yeah, that technology is out there to yeah, do it's, that. Yeah, it's, it's simple. We just need to right. get it all together. Yeah, we've also been trying to figure out how we can not kill as many more, as many trees as we print up not as many as we think because it just is a lot of paper. I mean, I, I print on the back of the paper, so this stuff I printed in my house, I used the back of last week's or something. But we do print up a lot of these booklets, and sometimes they're going away. So we try to strike a medium where we think there's going to we'll get enough for the people that are coming, but then you know not be short. And they also it's also available online, so uh, everybody doesn't need a hard copy. And as we go through the process with the law director's office and, and getting all of us you know coinciding and working, um, you know a little better together, then we'll be able to have your agendas earlier and be able to you know, you'll actually be able to look at them and read them in a timely fashion. So we're also working on that aspect. Yeah, it's, it's a problem because if, if, if Jean doesn't get the information from the administration and she doesn't get the legislation, then she can't make the agenda and then she can't get it to us. So it's, it's every week, it's kind of jockeying. Um, we, we hopefully, we would all love to get it on Friday, but it's just not possible. Because I didn't get this till, we didn't get this on the, on the web to what, but in the yesterday mm -hmm. afternoon? Yeah, so I wasn't here yesterday, so I, I, had, I printed it all out at home and, and went through it last night and this morning. Mm -hmm. And I know other people had other committee meetings and other things to do, and they probably didn't have as much time as I took, bleary-eyed, reading this stuff last night. Yeah, Mr. Greenspan. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. There's a, I'm, I'm ho hopefully now with the, the chief information officer on board um, who is experiencing this, 
a number of us went uh, a few weeks ago to Highland Software as an example. They, they provide uh, software to the county for the agenda and what have you. And we were presented at the time with a software application that um, will be coming to, to the Council Operations Committee probably within the next 30 days and then a presentation to Council. Not to vote on it because we need to RFP the process and what have you. But it will do, exa it, it does so many more things than we're capable of doing today. Um, as it relates to, to agenda management and management of legislation that um, I, I'm excited to bring it forward and I just found out earlier today that it's a fraction of the cost of what I even envisioned it would be. So um, at least this one product. So there is a solution and hopefully within the next 30 to 45 days we'll be able to bring something forward to council to review. Um, so I just want to bring that forward that there is, there is an immediate solution and hopefully we'll be presenting it shortly. All right, any other items that you want to go through on this evening's agenda? Now, usually we have a ton of stuff here. <laughs> a lot is getting referred to committee. Yeah, a lot of things. Yeah, every, just about everything getting referred to committee. Um, is there anything from um, the executive that they'd like to present at this time? Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, we do have items that uh, the county, excuse me, my back, that the county executive um, has signed off on this week. Uh, we're just waiting for a signature. It is complete, and we'll have that to you. Wait, I didn't understand. We you will speak. have the uh, agenda items that the county executive signed off on from last week, uh, just waiting for his signature, but we do have those completed. All right. We do have our new information technology person, and if we could do that, uh, Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Madam President. I have one question, and perhaps um, Bob can help. But in this list of items that were approved um, by the executive, um, the first one under the Department of Development is requesting approval to apply for, accept, and expend grant funds from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development in the amount of $2 million five plus. Um, it's on page one. Our agenda. I have on two. Well, yeah, pay, I'm sorry, page two. And it says requesting authority for the interim director to execute all documents required in connection with the said grant. And I'm, I'm just wondering, are we, did we receive this grant? Are we going uh, to apply for this grant? And um, with it being in the amount of two million five hundred thousand, uh, I, I would imagine some of this needs to come to council. Madam President, if I may, I may be able at least to offer some All insight right. on this. I can only surmise, I guess, at this point, but according to the interim contracting procedures, um, I believe that the departments were allowed to go ahead and apply for and accept grants and expect, expend the funds uh, according, according to that. Um, and it looks like at this point they must be in the process of applying for it in order to get the process started. So it looks like they're asking for the executive permission to do that. To the chair, to the councilman, I yeah. can... Um, uh, Nate Kelly is not here, but I can get a specific answer to you from uh, the development director. I, I'd like to so. have the process explained. I think maybe that's what you're saying, asking. So if we're getting money um, and we're acting as a pass-through, that it wouldn't necessarily come to council. Is that what you're saying? Madam President? Just, just as, as an example, um, with the NSP2 funds um, that came in and we had sitting at the county, I brought legislation forward a couple council sessions ago to authorize the administration to expend those funds. So we had a very um, limited legislation that addressed NSP2 funds for expending those on projects without council with an ordinance ongoing, I think we may need something for NSP3 for the administration to enter into contracts to spend this money, to use that money. So it comes into the county through the feds and then we need to approve or may want to approve 
the, the expenditure, and I think that's what Councilman Rogers is, is asking uh, about, that we did have legislation addressing NSP2, so perhaps we need it for NSP3. And Nate Kelly is probably the person who would know. Madam President. Yes. Um, I don't know if this is on point, but I do remember that when we were on council, specifically um, on the, um, the, the port committee, the airport committee, um, when we would receive federal funds uh, that would come to the committee, the acceptance of the, of the, of the funding. Um, so, Madam Pre If I may, Madam President, uh, Mr. Morales has just clarified that the, uh, that the administration under the ordinance would come to council when the expenditure, of, so after they receive the funds, when they expend the funds, if the expenditure is above the threshold, that's when they come to council, but they wouldn't come to council on the receipt of the funds. I don't know what the status is of this particular grant, but what that tells me is the money hasn't been spent yet, or ha there is no contract to spend it, or it's at least under whatever has been spent is under the threshold. It, and Madam President, that was my understanding as well, but what it confused me is that, you know, under this description, it does specifically say requesting approval to apply for, accept, and expend. Um, so it, it just seemed like we were oh, it's too late. taken out of the loop on that, that part. M Mr. Sharon has some reflection. Well, this is, the, these funds are coming in, as Mr. Brady says, but there's no request to expend the funds. And if it's below $100,000 per item, it would still be within the authority as we've described at the county executive. If it goes between 100 and 500,000, it would go to a different body. It would go to the Board of Controls. If it goes above 500, then we would actually see those expenditures coming here. So you are authorizing it if it stays below the $100,000 by, by, by accepting this, if it stays below, because we've already given that, once that's, once that's approved, that's, that's the, the direction we've given to the county executive that it stays. I, I believe that's assume, once we finalize and accept. Now it's going back to committee, but once we accept uh, the the amount within the contracting language, it's going to be between zero and a hundred thousand dollars. So with that, you would never hear. I mean, in theory, all two point five million dollars, if it was spent on projects below that number, would never come before us. So this list is just a list of notifications of contracts signed by the executive. So he's just notifying of this, of these things that he's done, but yeah. there's no expenditures. Is that, is it, that correct? It looks like things that have been pr uh, presented to him for his uh, executive calendar that he has signed off on. Is that correct, Bob? That is correct. Okay. Chair? Yes. If, correct me if I'm wrong, but the executive isn't operating necessarily at this point under that parameters of the legislation of 100,000 to 500,000 goes to Board of Control. He, he's operating under, you know, the previous. The right. temporary. The temporary. Right. Now, I, I would like to know what those parameters are, though, it, that he's, because. The 250, to the uh, chair. Yes. Um, to the Madam President, to the Councilman, that's $250,000 okay. under the, the current uh, arrangement, under the original rules. 250,000. Yes. Yeah, if I may, it, it's it's 250 under the existing ordinance, and it would be changed <coughs> under the new ordinance to 100, and then from 100 to 500 with the Board of Control, and then above that uh, comes back to council. But if I may clarify, and again, I'm, part of this is, is uh, a guesswork, educated guesswork uh, looking at this, but the way that I understand this is that this is the Department of Development making the request to the executive that they go ahead and do that. The executive is giving the department the authority to go ahead and try to seek the grants. Once the grants are, if the grants are granted or received, the actual contract to expend those dollars, if it's above the threshold, would necessarily come before, before council. So council would know at that point how the, the dollars are spent. But I think at this point, it's just simply authorizing the Department of Development to go ahead and seek the grants, at least the way that I'm reading this. I could be reading it incorrectly. But. Yes, Mr. Miller. Presuming it's as the law director says, it would probably be more helpful if the report said uh, uh, said applying for a grant as, as opposed to a, applying it and expending, which uh, 
which clearly suggests that uh, that a lot of money was spent way above the threshold, as Councilperson Rogers pointed out. So you're saying you should just say request uh, to apply and accept? Right. Okay. M Madam President? Just to follow up with Councilman Tron's point, if it's below the threshold of 250, as we have it set forth now, we wouldn't, it wouldn't even have, we can allow this to go through as long as it's below that number sure. to expand. Well, the red flag here was that 2,551,000. Two if it was a lump sum. So maybe the language for future has to make sure that we understand that if we approve an expenditure, it's below the 250. Because going to be spent in this lump sum for an NSP3 contract, but I understand the, like the concern. Well, see, my question is, like, if you go down to the um, public works, I guess it's one, two, three, fourth down, we are spending $205,000 to Johnson Control for maintenance of some kind of ventilation <laughs> system, and then Johnson Control has another contract for $90,000, which would put it over the two fifty. dollars So is this... You know, is this, this? It almost looks like splitting the contracts um, to get over to get around the, the 250 requirement. Well, Madam, Madam President, yes, th this goes to a discussion actually that Councilmember Miller and I had regarding the procurement ordinance, insofar as avoiding those areas where a contract may be. Let's go under the under the assumption that the legislation passes, and it's five hundred thousand dollars. If there's a contract that's in the amount of $500,000 in the aggregate, or there's a program or project, let me back up, program or project in the aggregate of $500,000, but it's divided up into 10 $50,000 contracts, yeah, we will never see it. Right. However, in the aggregate, the program, the project would have been, would have come before council, or at least some portion to the board of controls. And um, I think that's something we, we may continue to talk about is, is looking at programs or projects in the aggregate, not the individual contract value. Right, because that appears to what had been done here, mm -hmm. that you give the, the 205 and the 90 to get to, to split it so it's not, it comes under the 250. If, if that was the same project, yes. Well, it true. does. It looks like, well, one is, one is for um, ventilation and air, and the other one is for maintenance of fire alarm. But it's still with the same company. Madam yes. Chairperson, I, 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 you know, um, I don't think we should uh, border on uh, being too uh, conspiratorial. Um, it, the main thing we need is to have as much information as we can so we can make a, a judgment about what we're looking at. Um, and I think that was the idea of us of being able to red flag uh, items that were smaller if they drew our interest for any reason, uh, um, not for some reason of trying to understand how devious the administration might be, but, <laughs> per, but perhaps because curiosity. we have an interest in an area that, that falls below the, the, uh, the amount and we just want to have further discussion about it because we find that we have some questions that we want to ask and there's some interest in it. Madam President. Uh, Mr. Morales. Madam President, uh, I, I would like to make clear that the, the administration in no way I, I is wasn't, trying to I wasn't to alleging that. I was just curious. The, the ordinance. The, uh, when I first saw the expend language, this is not the first time that it's been used. Um, I advised the, the administration a, at the Board of Control the, the, of the need. To, you know, I had asked them for a clarification and advised them, of course, of the need to comply with the ordinance, and they fully understand that and indicated that should a contract be entered into above the threshold, it would go through its regular course and appear before council. Sometimes this grant money is used slowly even to uh, pay for salaries of individuals who are working at the department. So in that way, if it's allocated towards uh, s uh, salaries, for example, the money would be expended, uh, in, in not in a manner that would, that would violate the ordinance. Madam President, I assume, seeing how we have Mr. Morales up there, I, I assume that there are oftentimes a very legitimate need to have a project broken up into multiple different points. Uh, for example, fire suppression, though uh, an organization might have talent in both areas that are being identified in this particular case, it's one in which you have a competitive bid and it could have been awarded to somebody else other than the exact same 
uh, a successful bidder, I would think, in this it, particular case. Is that a correct? Yes. And so therefore, they just happen to have been the successful bidder on both the HVAC piece and the fire suppression piece. And as a result, it just happens to have their name on, on both, both pieces of it. I, Is that a correct I, assumption? I, 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 can't, I can't really speak to the facts of that. I, 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 I think that that's very plausible. Um, I, I just wanted to make clear that uh, to the extent that the administration is asking to apply for, receive, and expend grants in excess of the ordinance's contract uh, threshold, uh, they, that's not, uh, in, 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 there's no uh, attempt to circumvent the ordinance. It could be that that money is expended in small incremental amounts to meet legitimate needs of the program. Yeah, I really wasn't cons asserting a conspiracy. I was just, I, I, I just saw the, the same, um, the, the same company, and it's one is for ventilation and one is for fire alarms. So, so it's actually separate agreements. But I was just curious. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. You know, th th this very topic was, w we've brought it up several times under the mm -hmm. public works and, and contracting, and and uh, Mrs. Lockett has explained. The, the policies of, of contracting and assured us that it's on the radar screen. So if all counsel would hear her explanation, I That's think you'll have a little bit more uh, comfort. Thank you, um, Lenora. Lenora Lockett, Office of Procurement and Diversity. Currently the way that the purchasing division is set up is that the buyers are assigned by department. So there's a buyer that's assigned to public works and very engineer's office, well, when they were separate, things of that sort. So when the buyer goes through and um, approves purchases or goes through the purchase awards for items over the threshold, in this case, under the continuity resolution, anything over 25,000 has to go through a formal competitive bidding process or have to have an authorized exception such as state contract. So if the buyer for department, in this case, let's say public works, sees a contract come through for Johnson Controls at 2.30, then another contract come through for Johnson Controls at 2.20 or 2.40, where it could be perceived as being uh, end around the procurement process, then that's the responsibility of the buyer to red flag that and talk to the department to find out why the orders were split or what's the justification for that. In this case, these are two purchases where that vendor is one of the vendors for those services on state contract. And as the, as the previous stated by members of your council, those are items that would be separately bid in the, and in most cases anyway. So in this case, it just turns out that it are maintenance contracts, annual maintenance contracts for two separate items for that vendor that are on state contract. I thank you. Any other questions? That's very informative. Yeah, Madam President. Yes. I, I have an unrelated question to this topic, but a question for Ms. Lockett. Fine. But if Mr. Germana has something on this topic, I'll defer. No. Madam Chair, I, I just wanted to say, you know, the purpose of the state contract, so that every entity, uh, every city or governmental agency doesn't have to go out and bid and advertise and take the ads and so on and so forth and have personnel. So under state bid, that saves you the step and the expense from having ha having to go. Now, that's not to say that a municipality or a government agency uh, has to just accept that bid, but it, it does save a lot of money if you just uh, you know accept the state bids without having to individually every time uh, go out and, and contract for some of these things. Th thank you for the information. We're, this is all a learning curve for all of us, so thank you for not relying on your past experience. Uh, Mr. Greenspan? Thank you. Ms. Lockett, I have a question on contingency amounts in, in the contracts. Some contracts have a 10% contingency budget, or it might be called an overflow, overrun or overflow, whatever the term is. What contracts, how does that work? What triggers that? Do you, do you understand what I'm talking yes. about? Yes. Um, I believe it's only vertical construction where they have an allowance. Okay. Um, now, if you do an engineer's estimate, when you do your estimate for an uh, upcoming bid, you would put a 10% contingency in your estimate, but the bidder does not in his bid put a 10% estimate. If you're doing an engineering contract, you may do a, if authorized services for a certain amount so that you have room in case certain things unexpected come up. 
but traditionally in the bids there aren't except the vertical construction uh, contingency amount. Then, Madam President, w what is the um, protocol currently for accessing that contingency budget? How, how does a project that looks like it's going to need to require use of those funds, what's the protocol right now? How does that get, how those funds get dispersed? The vertical construction? And just in general. I mean, um, if That's the only one that I'm aware of, and okay. I believe they still had to go through the process where um, at the end, I'm not sure exactly how that works. At the end, if they have to use that money around, it still has to be documented as part of um, reconciling the contract. And and is, then if they is there an approval by, or was there in the past, the Board of Commissioners, did they approve the use of contingency funding at all? Yes, it or was my understanding it was approved. Any, any at one dime of the contingency fund had to be approved, and any amount, or was there a threshold? I don't, I will have to check, but I believe that there was a contingency amount in the contract, but it still had to get approval to use it. But it may not, again, remember the way they do amendments, they're not going to come one manhole or something, well, that, that's, um, but they're not going to come for one doorway, they're going to try to group the amendments based on what's effect efficient. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rubino? Matt Rubino, Office of Budget and Management. The, the question on contingency versus change orders and whether the commissioners have required some form of approval to tap those. If a construction contract, for example, had been approved in its entirety, that contract estimate would have incorporated perhaps some contingency. The commissioners, I believe, would have gone back and approved the use of that part of the contract is that the contract uh, in its whole form had already been approved. What they would be approving are change orders, so additions to the originally approved amount. So two different things, but if we're just talking a contingency component of a contract that's captured in that overall estimate, I don't think in the past they had approved those formally. It'd be change orders, which are separate. Um, and I see the clerk nodding, so I must be right. So, Madam President, yes, so, so if, if there was a million dollar project with a 10% contingency built in there, it was 1.1 million effectively if you look at it that way, that $100,000 could be utilized without any further approval because the original project scope included the contingency, is that what you're saying? Uh, Councilman Greenspan, yeah, that's, that, that's what I'm saying. Now there should be some form of project management on the county's part to understand why that 100000 or whatever that line was was spent and what it was spent on, but there would be no formal approval process by the commissioners or any kind of a formal sign-off by the commissioners. Okay, all right, thank you. I, just as, a, as an aside, this is very helpful because I plan on bringing forward some legislation to require some form of accountability for the use of contingency funding. So thank you for that information. Welcome. Madam Chair, can I yes, add just some information that I think is under my understanding? Uh, to, to Councilman Greenspan, a lot of these content. <laughs> I just wanted to add a little bit of information. A lot of these contingency contracts is based on an estimate, and, and normally the estimate's going to be on feet or quantities of, or a number of, of, of items, okay? And the estimate when the bid was was made they <coughs> a lot of times the bid is is on the quantity so much per per pound or so much cubic yard or so much per foot and even when they estimated it when they actually went and did the the contract there was more than was needed that's where the contingency would it would come in and they'd be authorized because they said it was going to be so much per foot cubic yard, uh, ton, so on and so forth. Um, so I think you should keep that in mind as, as long as it, it's bid that way and they have the, the specifications if, if the thing was under, under bid. We had a few cases just recently where uh, the county rescinded a contract or, or, or gave, a, gave a credit on a contract because at the end of the bid they found out that they didn't use as much quantity. So you remember, remember those. So you got to keep that in consideration because most of these contracts 
are, are bid based on a volume of something at so much quantity uh, per, per performance. Mr. Schwan. And uh, to follow up on Mr. Germano's comments, I think we have to be very conscious that we listen to the, the folks out here before we start building in contingency controls that actually end up costing us money because, as uh, we're talking about here, having built buildings, if you start to go down in the hole and the hole ends up being to hit the, uh, for, the, for the subterranean support, ends up being 45 feet versus your contingency that was built at 30, all of a sudden you don't want to stop, come back to this, this council, get approval of a $5,000 or $10,000 amount, only to find out that the job site now needs to be shut down, waiting for us to get back. We need to look at other techniques of perhaps reaffirming by action and giving a window or a dollar amount that, uh, the, that is more reasonable because of the fact you're staging equipment, you're bringing it on site, and all of a sudden, if you find out, uh, I'm, I'm certain that it will end up costing us more money in the long run if you have to restage a month later because you need to come back to this, this council. So I, need, I think that some of the discussions I've had, uh, even with Mr. Applebaum, and I'm sure uh, with Mr. Uh, Majij uh, on, on this, uh, where Majij, when we were talking about this, is that the, the issue is going to go potentially end up costing us more money if you stop the process and only to find out that, uh, uh, that it could have been done more effectively in our legislation by affirmation as opposed to uh, approval up front. And I don't know if that, if no, uh, I, I agree. that I, makes sense. I was just going to say, if, if you look at even, especially in the construction world out there, the number one litigation item is delay damages and issues of delay. And uh, you got to be careful sometimes in terms of when the, you put in the structure that you're not yourself causing the delay uh, especially to make even more complicated when you live in Northeast Ohio with the weather, you know, you have the, build, the, the construction season and when things happen and the delay. So I, I just raise that in terms of something to be careful. That's a policy decision, not necessarily a legal decision, but the legal aspect in this is uh, delay is a major issue in any construction uh, project. Madam, Madam President. I'm sorry, it wasn't, it wasn't my intent to say the threshold was going to be a penny. It would be, obviously, you don't want to pass legislation or put rules in place that would prohibit the administration or work from being conducted. It's just a safeguard to ensure that these contractors don't believe that they have a $1 million contract that they could spend at the 1.1 without getting any, any approval or any oversight. That's, that was my only contingency. My thought would be, although when Mr. Germano was trying to get my attention, I apologize, Mr. Miller was filling me in that in the procurement ordinance there is a provision for contingency funding. So I, I will not, it appears I might not need to bring anything forward. The comment was just merely, I don't want, in the past it appears that contractors doing business with the county have felt as if they had that, in our example, $1.1 $1 .1 million budget to work with without providing any true oversight. I wanted to prevent that from happening in the, in the future, but also to provide a, a, a threshold to which the job doesn't, stuff happens, I get it. I don't want to prevent things from not hap from work not being performed because we put too much legislative oversight into a scenario. I didn't have a, a position on what a percentage is an example of a project, but it was not going to be zero or, you know, or a penny over. It. There would be some leeway there. But it appears that's irrelevant now that Mr. Miller's brought it to my attention. Uh, Mr. Germano? Well, I think this might be helpful for you to understand uh, and actually explain a project that happened in in, in practicality. Uh, about a dozen years ago, we built a justice center in, in Parma, and we had a road go through, uh, and this was Powers Boulevard, and we have the justice center in Parma Hospital on Powers Boulevard, and the excavation contract uh, was done, and, you know, we had to put sewers in and the whole bit. But... The ex ex excavation contractor in particular, it was the quantity of, of dirt that had to be moved. And <laughs> the subsequent contract, it, it, it just was multi times what this contractor's bid was initially. But when you broke it down, they said it was going to be so much per yard or whatever that quantity was. So arbitrarily just saying if something is over a certain percentage of contingency, uh, 
if, it, if, if you're bidding it by, by the quantity, and in fact that's what needed to be done to, to meet the ultimate specifications, uh, it, it, it'll be justified. I hope that, you know, using that example, uh, you can understand how, how this works and how we gotta be careful. All right, anything further on this? All right, any other items that you want to discuss? President. Sir Roy Jones. It's actually an item that was actually on last week's agenda. Okay. Um, I'll share with you as, as, as we've all traveled around the county, just learning what's going on in the county. I visited the YWCA at 4019 Prospect. I learned, learned what they were doing they, for, for women who were aging out without ever being adopted. They tr uh, created transitional housing that could be rented uh, for the, for the uh, young ladies to rent. And um, I knew that they had a contract coming up. Well, I actually thought that that contract was on last week's agenda. It was resolution 99, but this one was through the Department of Development. It says at 4019 Prospect, there was $150,000 for rental rehabilitation loan uh, to Cleveland Housing Network. Now that's in Department of Development. Uh, is I, I think I saw Mr. Warner come in. Uh, it, it, can someone speak to uh, the contract that I thought was coming before us with YWCA? I want to just take it aside and commend Mr. Jones. I think he has been to more places than anybody. He he really needs to be commended. He's done a tremendous amount of visitation and, and going around and bringing back information to all of us. Well, thank you. I know everybody's done done it too, though. Uh, Madam President, um, to Councilman Jones, Rick Warner from the Office of Health and Human Services. Um, I saw, as you did, um, Councilman, the, the development contract with the YWCA on last week's agenda. Um, the last year, or actually I think two years ago, when the YWCA was putting together its funding package, its finance, capital financing package um, for that new, I think they call it, I want to say Independence Place, but I'm not positive if that's the, the, the name of it, of their new facility. Um, which that was will, last week's agenda, Independence Place Project. Which, which will assist, um, among others, um, young women um, coming out of DCFS, Children and Family Services, um, who are aging out of the foster care system. Um, the commissioners made a commitment, not, I believe, on the capital side, but on the operating side, um, to, um, I think it was a three-year commitment, and I don't have the papers with me, so I apologize for I'm doing this from memory. I think it was for about um, fifty or $60,000 a year for operating subsidy. Um, they had put together um, quite a great deal of um, funding partners to fund the ongoing operations as opposed to the capital side. Um, and the commissioners made a commitment to funding through a, a contract with the Department of Children and Family Services um, for, uh, I believe it was around $60,000 a year for a three-year period. I can go back and get that information. We have not yet started the process to, um, to get, put that contract into place. Um, I believe Irene Collins is the acting, or maybe now the permanent um, director of the YWCA. She's definitely uh, communicated with us and we need to get back to her. So um, it is in the operating budget of the Department of Children and Family Services, but that contract hasn't come forward yet. But as far as the capital budget for I, mean, I would have to direct that to the to, to the Department of Development. I know that we were a piece of it, but again, I think the, the part that they were relying on human services for was for a three-year commitment for um, operating subsidy once they, once they opened up for service, and they may well be open for service at this point. So that, and they are open for service. They are renting to young ladies at this point. Okay. So, uh, and, and you, I heard what you said. I just want to be able to give it back to you. You, you've approved for the operating budget mm -hmm. already. Was that last week's item? Or no, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to confuse things. No, we, we have not yet brought forward the contract for the operating piece. The contract that was introduced, I believe, or the agreement that was introduced last week, I'm not positive, but I believe was on the capital side, not on the operating side. But I'll defer to Mr. Kelly. And, okay. And, and, okay. And you could if let mistaken. me know the status of the capital um, portion of the YWCA contract. Wherever it, whatever the status is. Madam Chair, to Councilman Jones. Um, at last council meeting, what was approved was $150,000. Just speak into the microphone. $150,000 from our rental rehabilitation program. 
Um, it's to rehab 22 units for supportive housing for that site. So they'll be borrowing those dollars, they'll be matching it up with other dollars that they've uh, accumulated to do a rehab for the site. The, the operating capital will be different than what uh, the director was talking about. Okay. Maybe we can follow up a little later after. Okay. Okay, thank you. Ms. Uh, Simon. Madam Chair, as long as we had Mr. Kelly up there, I uh, um, could ask him to explain about Mr. Um, Rogers' question on the NSP funds, the NSP3. We have, um, there was an approval by the administration to, um, is it to receive the money, expend the money? It's a $2 million um, NSP grant. Sure. If you can. So, um, Madam Chairwoman to Councilwoman Simon, the, I, I wasn't present for the question, but I can elaborate a little bit on what was approved last week. Uh, there is the third round of neighborhood <coughs> stabilization program funding. Uh, the first round came out a couple years ago. Round two was last year. Uh, and now round three will, is what we applied to receive uh, and had approval to apply for to receive and then program the NSP3 funds. Uh, there'll be three different programs that we intend to spend the NSP3 dollars on. <coughs> um, one is a competitive grant program where cities will compete to apply for funding for these NSP3 dollars. Um, they will be for programs related to housing, rehab, demolition, um, and, uh, and then that'll be the bulk. Um, and then a number of it will be for, some of it will also be for uh, the Department of Development and our, hou our housing division um, to spend those dollars. Also for um, housing, blight remediation, um, demolition, and rehab for the programs that we already have in place. If there are contracts or loans that uh, rise above the threshold that would be reviewed by council, they would come to this body and then also would be reviewed at Board of Control and public for any sort of loans or grants or dollars that are spent. We're just applying to receive the dollars from the federal government. Ma Madam President, just a quick question about the restrictions on how this money can be spent. There's not much flexibility, is there? I mean, we have the mandate from, from the feds how to spend the money, is that true? And That's right, the, there is very little flexibility. Uh, we applied for and received what's called a waiver um, to get some more flexibility. Specifically, uh, we're limited to spend about 10% of our, our NSP dollars towards demolition. Um, demolition in a lot of neighborhoods actually improves property values. And so we received a waiver so that we can spend up to 20% of our award on demolition dollars. All right, any other questions of Mr. Kelly on any subject? Jamana? Well, Madam Chair, this is a uh, different subject, but uh, Mr. Kelly may have an opinion about this. Um, in particular, we're, we've got resolution R211-075, um, and this has to do with the uh, rehabilitation of Taylor Road from Euclid Heights Boulevard to Cleveland Heights North Corporation line and uh, declaring this resolution uh, emergency. Now, this is a project that, that's got four million from the federal share, 250,000 from the county share and, and, and Cleveland Heights Municipal share was 779,000, okay. It, it just so happens that before the meeting yesterday, I had a briefing from uh, Howard Meyer with the NOACA, and we were talking about different projects and so on and so forth. I don't know how this uh, Taylor Road came up, but uh, it was, and, and then after our meeting yesterday, I, I, I talked to Mr. Rogers and I says, you know, it's a shame that here in, in Cleveland Heights, this Taylor Road is, and I don't know Taylor Road in particular, but I guess it's atrocious. And it's stopping at, at East Cleveland. And um, what, what we have in Cuyahoga County is we have Cleveland at the core, then we have entering suburbs, then we have outer ring suburbs. And basically, East Cleveland didn't have the funds 
to do anything with Taylor Road. But it's just not the, the people of East Cleveland are affected. It's, it's the people of Cleveland Heights and further out that are using Taylor Road. You know, you've got a perfectly nice road out through Cleveland Heights that's going to be rehabilitated, and then all of a sudden you're going to be going, and it's going to be a you know, disaster. I don't know how to solve that. But if, if someone can come up with uh, some kind of combination or contingency funds so that, uh, you know, we're not, it's not penalizing the people of East Cleveland, it's penalizing everybody that's got to go through East Cleveland. Um, if you understand what I'm saying is, is, the, uh, is the dilemma. Because anytime you need this local match, and especially with the pressure that uh, the new state budgets put on, on, on local governments, um, you may have more people penalized for having a city that can't afford uh, proper roads. And being an insurance man, um, I can tell you that you know, you're driving along, uh, we've had more collision claims. You know, people, when you hit, and we don't call them chuck holes, we call them potholes. Uh, when you hit, hit a pothole, oh. no, I mean, seriously, it's forbidden. <laughs> <laughs> In Parma, you cannot call it a chuck hole. It's, I've always corrected people, it's potholes. But some of these potholes have been so significant that it comes under collision because you're actually colliding with the hole. And most people have a deductible. So, I mean, in these times, it's been a strain on people uh, because they have a deductible on collision. They're paying for rims, for tires. And so, really, when you look at the whole effect to Cuyahoga County, uh, it's a problem because it's affecting more than the people in the city that, that couldn't afford uh, or, or didn't want to participate. So I'm just bringing up something that was brought to my attention. I don't have any solution, but I, I thought, you know, maybe someone would be able to come up with it. Are you sure, Scott? How, how can you? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're called nate holes. That's right. Madam President, uh, there are, that is a need that is shared in a number of different categories. Uh, the NSP3 grant, for example, creates an opportunity for competitive, for cities to compete um, for grants to pay for things that they wouldn't otherwise afford, either by choice or need. Uh, one of the things that we're going to be working on in the Department of Development is a competitive grant program for cities to participate in for how CDBG infrastructure funds are allocated. Um, we'll be able to increase the pool somewhat with respect in response to a decrease in local government funds. We can encourage cities like East Cleveland to apply for that. We can also set up the way that we rank these competitive grants to be responsive to that need. Another thing you mentioned, um, Howard Mayer, who's executive director of NOACA. NOACA is the body that receives all of our federal infrastructure dollars and then they're allocated. One thing that we'll also be working on is being able to prioritize and rank those program those um, requests that come from the county and get to NOAC, whereas previously those requests came from many voices and I think diluted our ability to ask and compete for some of those federal infrastructure dollars. Um, and uh, Councilman Germana is your representative on that board and, and uh, we sit next to each other at those meetings and we'll make sure that we're competing um, and advocating for cities like East Cleveland to help attract those dollars. Mr. Gallagher. I, I, Madam President, I'd just like to say that this, uh, uh, Mr. Germano brings up the age old question of, you know, the problems that we had. We, we had 82 going through Strongsville, North Wilton and Columbia were not ready. So we had a beautiful road through Strongsville and then you get to those areas. So it's not just Cleveland Heights, East Cleveland, it's, it's everywhere and, it, and I think it highlights our, uh, our problem with uh, with moving forward with re regionalization, because God forbid you you get through beautiful Strongsville and you go into Columbia Township and you get Germanid as we call it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ms. T. One, did you want to address it? If if I may, um, I, I agree with everything you say as far as 
how we prioritize our projects. And one of the things that, that we're going to look at in the future is look at the, the main arterial roads that service all of Cuyahoga County and prioritize those roads and look at those as corridors through the county and not necessarily just city by city. And then we can approach the, the conditions, the volumes, the, um, the, the need for repairs through those corridors and not just in a particular city, not just because one city can afford to do the repair. But when we start talking local dollars, the only quote unquote local dollars that the, fed, the, the federal government will allow would be the, the $5 and the $7.50 uh, license plate tax that's considered a local dollar or a dollar from the the local communities wherever they get that from so um, it, it comes down to prioritizing the projects and where we're spending our money um, you know we're, we're not flush with money either especially when you're talking about the, the limited local money that we have available so we really have to look at those corridors as a whole and prioritize those corridors and how we address those and that's something in the future that um, we're going to put together and come up with a comprehensive plan on how we address those areas. Uh, Ms. Kawa? So, Madam Chair, to Ms. Tewin, so what you're saying, if, if East Cleveland is a city that doesn't have the dollars to match with the NSP funds, the only um, solution that they have is maybe going up on the license plate fees in order to accommodate this the, 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 each local community gets a share of the, the gas tax dollars. Um, so th we can actually pull, I think uh, even online, we can pull up the amount of money that East Cleveland, for example, gets in, in gasoline tax, and that's considered their local share or local money that they can use on, on roads. Um, the, the license plate fee comes to us, Cuyahoga County, um, as dollars that we can use for road improvements. And there's two, two separate fundings. One was passed in the early 80s, one was passed in the 80s, and one was passed in the 60s. Um, so we have that av availability, and that's the money that we use in the different communities um, to, to help with the, the local share. Is there a difference between the $5 fee and the 750 I'm, I'm yes confused. there is okay yes there is the I have I have to get this right the the five dollar fee that's when you get your license plate you pay that Correct. extra five dollars well actually you you pay an extra fifteen dollars okay. um, the first five dollars which I believe was in the sixth passed in the 60 that that particular five dollars um, is very specific that if you want to use that those dollars you have to identify and you actually have to apply apply to use those dollars so that's why you'll see us come in the we council this, yeah. asking to use that five dollars there there's in the 80s there was legislation that was passed that has two five dollars added on to your la license plate so now you have a total of fifteen dollars a five dollar from the 60s and then two five dollars the first five dollars comes to the county um, the second five dollars is split between the county and the local communities. So um, whatever so city you live in? Gets two, 250 um, that goes, goes to that community, the, the city that you live in where the car is registered. So the, the 750 is a combination of $5 and, and 250 Did I explain that right? <laughs> and then what about the third $5? The, the, the third $5 is split into, is split in oh, half, the, right, okay. the 250 okay, and right. the 250. Okay. Madam Chair. Clear as yes. mud now, right? <laughs> as long as we're talking about this, um, currently this is, there's a time period now of public input on, on the uh, transportation improvement projects for over a three year period in the five county uh, area of, of Nowaka. And you could go online Noaka's website, and if you want to see what is happening in your district uh, and, and planned over the next three years, uh, it's available. Now, I did get a hard copy uh, that I, I, I want to leave at the, the council office because it's much easier to, to flip through and, and see it in, in paper instead of trying to find it 
through, uh, through, through the many pages on, on the website. But it's interesting. You'll see actually bridges and, and roads and, and uh, different uh, transportation, even trails that are, are planned over the next three years. Mr. Rogers. Madam President, um, while we are still on this subject, we talked a little bit about this in, in committee regarding the Taylor Road project. And um, at that time, we talked about the um, divisions of, of payment on who pays what. And um, But I, since then, I've, I've had some further communications with constituents regarding the project. And I'm wondering, what's the level of involvement of the county when it comes to the actual design? Um, at, with this particular project, the area of, of uh, Taylor Road that's being um, redone, <clears throat> resurfaced, uh, is a very wide street. It's about seven lanes. And I think under the new redesign, they're looking at narrowing the, the lanes so there's not so much surface area. But what I'm hearing from constituents, particularly the ones that live directly across the street from Severance at Taylor, is that they're, they would like to see, under this redesign, um, their tree lawns lengthened. Um, because with snow removal, as it currently is on that street, uh, those residents suffer from high mounds of snow when the, when the trucks come through. And currently, my understanding of where we are in the design phase of this is that um, they're not looking to lengthen tree lawns, but actually lengthening on the side where the mall is. And I'm wondering if, if we're involved in those discussions at all, or is that completely up to the, to the city and city council? Actually, this particular project, and it, 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 it's very specific to the project and who's administering the project. On this particular project, the city took the initiative to prepare the plans, to hire consultants to prepare the plans. All of that information is, is going through the city to the consultant that's actually preparing the plans. We have no involvement in that. Ms. Simon? Thank you. I just have a, a separate question for Mr. Kelly. Um, thanks. I had a question from um, one of the cities, South Euclid in particular, who had a question about the exterior maintenance grant program do you, do you have any information about its status and whether it's going to be continuing? Is the exterior maintenance grant program called something else? Because I don't know a program by that name. Okay. I'm not sure it's whether I'll, – I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Okay. Okay, thanks. Ms. Simon? Uh, yes. I'm sure. Uh, actually, I had a call on that, and uh, they haven't dispersed the funds yet. They're looking at it. I had a call from North Royalton, so they're, they're working on that. It, it could be weeks. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. Okay, do we have any uh, miscellaneous committee reports? I have one question, yes. Madam President. Um, this is to the administration, Mr. Ivory. Maybe you can take this back to Dave Merriman, Mr. Merriman. Um, there is a question on page two about a contract awarded regarding the Fatherhood Initiative funding um, to a Mary Malloy. And I just had a question, if you can get back to me at some point about that. It's on page two of this, the contracts that were awarded under Health and Human Services. But I just want to put that out there that I, there was some question when we heard from, I forgot his name, from, yeah, Mr. Grimes at, during our meeting. Um, I just had some concern about du duplication of services and this particular contract to Mary Malloy. I just wanted to get information about exactly what that's for. Madam Chair, to the Councilwoman, yes, I will um, uh, give you a response on that. Yes, Mr. Uh, Miller. Madam President and my colleagues, the Finance and Budgeting Committee is going to meet. Uh, next Monday at 1 o'clock, it's regular time. And, uh, and I, have, I have asked uh, Mr. Rubino to come and make a presentation to us and give us an overview about the financial implications of the uh, initiatives that were presented by the executive in the state of the uh, county address. All right, thank you. 
Anything further? We have um, miscellaneous uh, our business, miscellaneous, um, any miscellaneous business? Madam President. Yes. Uh, I noticed looking forward on, on the calendar that there's a, a special council meeting been set up for next uh, Tuesday, and I just would like uh, some overview as, as to what we're going to do then. Right. On, this, on, the, um, on the 19th, we were not going to have a regular meeting, but we do have an item that we have to deal with on the, is that the Board of Control? But, uh, the, but the work session on the 19th, I want to devote to, and I think we've shared it with most of you, I want to devote to the rules because uh, Mr. Miller has done a tremendous amount of work on the rules, but uh, we've all been very busy, and uh, these rules are rules that we're going to have to live with for a lifetime, I guess. So I want everyone to take the opportunity to go through those rules carefully and see if there's any objections, any changes that you want to have. So we'll have the entire two hours to go through that. Now, um, um, Joanne Gross uh, has made some comments. I've made some comments. I believe some other people have made some comments. Um, the, the staff. There's issues about the timing. I think it came up earlier about the ability to get the agenda. Um, there's an issue about, um, there's a reference in the rules to a journal of council. We need a clarification on that as to what would be included to make sure that we don't pass a rule that we're not complying with. So um, we've got to have some conversation with all of the staff and everyone on council to make sure that we get these rules right. And uh, then I believe there, and then at the regular meeting, we weren't going to have a regular meeting, but, and then Jean can probably tell us there was one item that we need to, 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 to do, so it's fairly right. surely. Well, the first was going to be the council of the whole uh, going over the rules, right. and then if we needed it, we have it in there as a special meeting pending the possible um, right. bringing forth of the uh, law director's um, department. Right, so we'd rather give notice and cancel the meeting if we had to than to not have the, the notice available because there may be some other legislation presented by, by the executive that we, we need to address. I know that uh, Mr. Schron here is, <laughs> I wonder why we're meeting every week, um, but it's because we've just got things that we would just as soon pass and not, not get held up. Madam President. Yes. I just don't want any illusions created that once we pass these rules that we're stuck with them forever. It, it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's typical for, uh, for some changes to be made from time to time. And so uh, uh, I think we're going to give it our best shot and we're going to have a, a good set of rules in place, but, uh, but we're going to learn from experience and more changes will be made down the road. Oh, okay. I agree with that, but you know, I, I don't know if the public or those know, know how hard all of us have been working. And you know, you, you think you're going to have time for one item and then something else happens and you know, your committee meetings, you're doing different things. So I just wanted to try and set this time aside just for the rules to make sure that everybody can kind of concentrate on that. We do have, you know, we have the opportunity to change them, but I'd rather get them right first to make sure that everyone understands so that you don't kind of come up later and say, well, gee, I didn't know that was in the rules. Madam President. Yes. I'm certainly for, for taking time on it and, and giving it our best shot and coming as close as we possibly right. can. But I, I also, uh, if, we, uh, if we take the attitude that it's, this is it for all time, while well, we'll never come to a conclusion and we won't get it done. So, uh, so we got no, to take, get it done, we got to take give, a balanced view. Well, this will just give us a chance to, you know, to go over them. It's good. I right. support it. All right. Is there any public comment uh, on the work session that you'd like to have before we take a, uh, when we adjourn the work session? All right. If there are a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right. Uh, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it. We will adjourn and start our regular council meeting. Prom